before we study the word, let's pray. Father, we come into your presence acutely aware that it's insane that we're here. Who can be saved? A rich man, a preacher, a Presbyterian? No. But what is impossible is possible with you. We praise you that you came for us, that you taught the truth for us, that you died on a cross for us, that you got up from the grave for us. Father, this morning, particularly when we count your goodness, we're thankful for our country, for the plenty you have given, for the heritage that is ours, for the freedom that we know. And especially this weekend, Father, we, we remember those who gave up so much, even their lives that we might be free. We thank you for them. And we rise up as a people and we call them blessed. Father, you know every person in this place and you know the stuff that's really hard now. The sleepless nights, the sin that eats away the secrets we can't share, the perspiration on our forehead, the doubts of our minds. We're needy and we're sinful, but we're here. Meet us in this place. May we hear the soft sound of sandaled feet. As always, we pray for the one who teaches that you would forgive him his sins. There's so many. We would see Jesus and him only, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. A week ago, we interviewed Oz Guinness on our talk show. Oz is a Longtime friend, a great author, and he writes wonderful books. I found out for the first time that he is the Guinness of the Guinness family that produces the Guinness drink. I made some smart comments because the last time I was in Ireland, I tried that stuff. It's like axle grease, it is awful. I can't imagine why anybody in the world would drink that stuff. But it was Ireland, and I was in Belfast, and then later went to Ireland, and everything is Guinness, so I drank it. Eric said on the talk show, he's our producer, he said, if you were in Amsterdam, would you smoke hash? And I said, no. I'm not going to do anything over there that is illegal here. Hash is illegal here, and Guinness ought to be. <laughs> and then I welcomed uh, Oz to our program. <laughs> and I said to him, just dawned on me, if you're part of that family, you got a lot of money, more money than God. And I said, Oz... I've got an idea. Why don't you give a significant contribution to Key Life? And I'll never say anything bad about Guinness again. And he laughed and said he was from the poor side of the family. At any rate, we were discussing his book, The Last Christian Standing on Earth. And... Uh, 
I was told about the chaplain, in fact, the, the physician to King Henry VII. He was an educated man, and he read Greek and Hebrew, and in those days, you riffraff of lay people simply were not allowed to read the Scriptures. But this man was given the Gospels because he was educated uh, by his priest, and he read the Gospels, and then he came back and gave them to his priest. And he said something that is profound. He said this. He said, either these are not the Gospels or we're not Christians. <laughs> As I read the Gospels in general and about Jesus in particular, he's never, he's never what I expected, and he's been messing up my life from the beginning. He doesn't fit into anybody's mold. He doesn't work the way I want him to work. He doesn't love the people I want him to love. And he goes to places where the whores and the drunks are that if you were proper, you just wouldn't do. If you have your Bible, open it to the book of Mark, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a text about an improper Messiah, and then we're going to talk about it for a little while. doesn't sound that way when you first start reading it, but when you think about it, it absolutely blows you away. And this is what Mark wrote. And I'm going to start at the 17th verse of the uh, 10th chapter of Mark. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And the young man said to Jesus, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And his disciples were amazed at these words. But Jesus said to them, children, how difficult it is, period, to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, With man it's impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and we have followed you and Jesus said truly I say to you there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Now, before we look directly at that text, I want to go down one side road, and I want you to see the amazing statement of Jesus about himself. Now, if you read this text in a superficial way, 
the young ruler comes to Jesus and says, good master, and Jesus says to him, nobody is good but God. Now, there are those people that will take you to that text and say, see, Jesus is not God. There is nobody good but God. But do you know what Jesus was saying? He was saying, do you know what you just called me? You called me good. And nobody's good but God. You just called me God. And that is awesome. Did you know that all heresy begins with Christology? What we think about Jesus is very, very important. He's not a great teacher. He's not a wonderful person. He's God. And if he's not, as Lewis has said... And we've quoted him so often it's become a cliche, but it's true. The only three choices you have is that Jesus is a megalomaniac, psychotic, insane, or that he's a liar, or that he is the incarnation of the very God of the universe. Those are the only alternatives that you have. As I said, every heresy begins right here. The Apostle John in his letters warned those who read the letters about anybody who doesn't get who Jesus was right. And you ought to be warned too. It's the one place where you don't compromise. It's the basis of fellowship. It's the reason for all that we do. I love Jehovah's Witnesses. I really do. They come to my house. They're not even supposed to come into our neighborhood so they break the law, and I like to point that out to them. And then to reference scripture about our obedience to the government. But they come anyway, and I like them. They're really more committed than Presbyterians. And some of them are better looking than you are, too. And they've memorized a whole lot of stuff. The last time they came to my house, uh, I was uh, closing the garage door, and this old guy and young guy came up and said, could we talk to you a minute? I said, no. You can't. I don't have time. And you need to know that I'm doing you a favor. And one of them said, how is that? I said, you guys are Jehovah's Witnesses, right? And he said, yes. And I said, I admire you guys. Everything about you except what you teach. And it is scary. And, and most of the people you talk to don't know why. I want you to know I've been a Bible teacher longer than you've been alive, and I know what I'm talking about. I teach at the seminary, and you can see the tower of the seminary across the way from my house. And, uh, and I would, frankly, eat your lunch. But I don't have time to talk, and uh, so I'm doing you a favor. And a young guy said, uh, you think we could come back? And the old guy said, son, let's leave. And, uh, and they walked out. Where would I have started? I would have started at Christology. Because they use a spurious translation of the scriptures by a scholar who didn't know Greek. And they say Jesus was a God. As soon as somebody says that, a teacher, a good man, then get out of the way because that's the beginning of all era, the beginning of all heresy. I've had a hard week. I've asked you to pray, I think, on a number of occasions for Omar, my former student. Omar's son uh, has leukemia and they're not sure he's going to make it. A year, a little over a year ago, Omar found out that he had ALS. That's Lou Gehrig's disease. And he died we, last week. We had a memorial service at the seminary, and I spoke for it. And uh, I hated it. The week before, I uh, was over at Omar's and spent some time with him and walked out to the car, Marvat, his wife, took me out to the car, and she was smiling. And I said, what are you smiling about? There's nothing to smile about around you here. And she wasn't smiling like 
I don't want to smile. I want to die, but I don't want to hurt my witness for Jesus, and so I'm going to grin like an idiot so people will praise you. I mean, it was from the inside. It came from the bone. So what are you smiling about? She said, you know what I did last night? She said, I, uh, I stayed up all night, and I yelled at God, and I cried out to him. And at 5 o'clock this morning, I went in my kitchen, and I got my coffee, and I sat down, and I said, God, I've been talking and yelling and crying out all night, and I'm through. Now, it's your turn. And then she said he came. And he loved me. And he gave me peace. Be praying for Mervat and for the four boys, we had dinner with them after the funeral. The day after, it seemed, seemed kind of normal. So God's doing. And then this week, we got the message that the chairman of the Key Life Board, the ministry for which I work, that their son had been killed in a boating accident in South Florida. So on Thursday, we... We drove down, uh, and I conducted the funeral. I didn't kid around. I didn't give any cliches or wonderful answers because I said to them, I don't have any answers. Used to be when I was young and didn't know anything, I had answers for everything. But I've wiped so many tears away and cleaned up the blood after so many suicides and stood beside so many graves and deathbeds that I've learned to be quiet in the face of awesome pain. And then I said, and I said this at Omar's service too, there's hope. Because there's one who's been there and come back to talk about it, and he said, he who believes in me will never die. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me i go to prepare a place for you and i'll come again and receive you unto myself that's comforting that gives hope and even in the midst of the tears joy unless jesus is just a nice rabbi saying things that he doesn't know if he's that he doesn't know any more than i do if he's only that, he can't speak to our hearts. If he's only that, what in the world are you doing here this morning? Go do something that's productive and fun. Because when it's over, you're dead, and that's all. But if Jesus is God, and he is, then there's hope, and there's laughter at funerals. Enough about that. Jesus has been messing up my life ever since I met him. <laughs> this is a great job being a pastor. Now, I'm not your pastor. Uh, I love your pastor, and I do this because he knows dirt on me and makes me do it. But I'm not your pastor. But I've been a pastor almost all of my life, and that is a really cool job unless Jesus is God. I remember the first church I served was on Cape Cod. Have you ever been to Cape Cod? Now, that is one cool place. You ought to see the golf courses there. And the fishing is magnificent, and the beaches are to die for. The restaurants are wonderful. And I was the pastor on Cape Cod, and I thought, I've died, and I've gone to heaven. Listen, all they required, it was a little church, was that I visit the sick and the hospital. There were only two or three. I can do that in a half an hour. And then they wanted me to talk. I can talk. That's what I do, man. I have a glib tongue. All I had to do was stand in a pulpit and talk for 20, 25 minutes. I can do that. And I thought, what a wonderful job. And then Jesus came and screwed it up. <laughs> he really did. And I began to see the places he wanted me to go, the hard truths he wanted me to teach. 
what it meant to be church, the people he wanted me to love that I didn't want to love, the way he wanted me to live, and I didn't want to live that way. Jesus had been messing, messing with my head from the very beginning. In fact, I wouldn't do this for anybody but him. So I love him, but that doesn't mean that he say, a friend of mine went to see Paul Van Buren. That name doesn't ring a bell to you, but he was one of the three theologians. And I forget, well, one was Thomas Aldizer at Emory. And there was another one, I forget his name. And they were the ones who taught and promulgated a movement in America called the God is Dead movement. If you or old enough to remember, you remember it was on the pages, the front page, the cover of Time Magazine and Newsweek, and it was everywhere, the trial of God. God had died. They quoted Bonhoeffer improperly, and I'm now reading Metaxas' 600-page book on Bonhoeffer, and they lied, but they misquoted Bonhoeffer, that God was dead, and since he was dead, we were going to have to carry on. It was really stupid. Anyway, my friend went to visit Van Buren, and uh, Dr. Van Buren said to him, you know, I like you guys, and he was talking about evangelicals better than I like liberals. At least you believe something, and it's divine. I don't believe it, but at least you believe something. And my friend said to Dr. Van Buren, if I could prove to you this is true, that a dead man got up and walked, what would you do if I could prove it? And he laughed, Van Buren did, and he said, I would say there must be another explanation. Uh, Walter Rosenbusch uh, and the social gospel movement had a warm, fuzzy feeling to it. They said that Jesus was a social reformer. When you read the gospel, you find out that he was the cause of social reform, but not himself a social reformer. And then you point it out and they say, well, there must be another explanation. We want to make him into a proper Presbyterian, <laughs> maybe even an elder. We're, we're not sure he's Presbyterian, but we do think that when he returns, he'll come to a Presbyterian church first. And I'm a Calvinist. Everybody knows that as you read the words of Jesus, he's a Calvinist, except the Methodist, who are sure that he's Arminian, and the Pentecostals who think that even though it's not reported, he spoke in tongues. None of us like Roman Catholics, but they're sure they've got it right. And everybody takes Jesus, who doesn't fit anywhere, pushes him into their mold, and makes him one of theirs. I do that too. I do that all the time. I don't study the scriptures so I can find out what they say. I know what they say. I've been teaching it for all my life. I know what the gospels say about Jesus. I don't study them to find out. I study them because every time I read the gospels and the scriptures, Jesus comes and he corrects the ideas that are spurious, and he goes deeper than I want to go, and he reminds me of things that I don't particularly like, and he calls me to take up a cross and to follow him. Now, I'm going to show you three or four things in this text that are, that are really interesting about proper messiahs. Proper messiahs, first, don't love unlovable people or at least they don't love them until those lovable people do something lovable that would cause him to love them. Look, if you will, at the uh, 21st verse. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Now, don't, don't miss this. Don't get caught up into this lovable rich guy. He wasn't. He was self-righteous, incredibly self-righteous. If I ask you if you have lived up to the law of God, almost all of you will say sometimes yes and sometimes no. What did this young man say? He said, yes, I've lived since my youth. I've been pure and perfect and obedient. 
he was rich. And I don't have any brief against rich people. I've been with a lot of them. Some of them are twits and some of them aren't. Some of them use their money well, some of them don't. This young man was rich and he was the twit type. And he was looking for attention. Jesus was kind of the end thing at this time and he wanted to be around the end thing. And Jesus looked at this arrogant, rich, self-righteous twit. And what? He loved him. Proper messiahs don't do that. They may hang out with them, but they, uh, but they give you a chance to get better so you can be more lovable than you are. And then they love you because there's a reason. But Jesus loves them when they're unlovable. I remember when I was a pastor in Miami, I was thinking about it when we were down there this week. Uh, one of the leaders of a drug, drug rehabilitation center, a very large ministry, wanted to bring his kids to our church, and he brought one or two busloads of some of the roughest young people you've ever seen in your life. I don't think they had a bath. They'd all been on drugs. Their language wasn't proper, and they didn't know how to act in a Presbyterian church, okay? One of my elders, and I was with him this past week, <laughs> Charlie, <laughs> He had two daughters, and they were the same age as my daughters, and he came into my study one time, and he said, Steve, I don't like this at all. He said, I don't like the influence these kids are having on my daughters. I don't trust them. I don't want them around here. And I said, Charlie, I'm the same way, man. I love my daughters more than you love yours. And it keeps me awake at night. It really, really bothers me, frankly. And then I said, but Charlie... What about Jesus? He got quiet. And he said, oh, spit. Actually, that isn't what he said. <laughs> he was a little stronger than that. And he just turned and walked out of my study. Not another word out of him or me. And we saw those kids come to Christ and we see God. You know, you know, you got to love some very unlovable people because, and here's the kicker, you recognize that you are not so lovable. The principle is this. You can't be loved or there is a correlation between love and need. A correlation between love and need. And if you don't recognize the need, you never get hugged. Jim Morrison was gay. And he wrote me a letter because of something really angry. He was the, he was, I may have told you about this, he was the columnist for the National Gay and Lesbian Newspaper. And he was angry because I had said what he was doing was wrong. I wrote him back and I said, I'm not saying what you're doing is wrong because I'm right. I'm more wrong than you are and my sins are deeper than yours. But my concern for you is that you burned a bridge to God, not to change, but to be hugged because you don't think you need to be hugged. Jim's a Christian now. He's celibate. He's written a book, Beyond Gay, and God is using him in a wonderful way. I'm not throwing rocks at anybody. How can I do that? But, but if there's no need, you don't get love. And that's sad. So the prerequisite of being able to connect with Jesus isn't that you be wonderful or pure or obedient all the time. The prerequisite is that you recognize that you're unlovable and that he loves you anyway. Three or four weeks ago, I preached at the Seminole County Jail I spoke for their fundraising banquet, and the chaplains there wanted me to have a tour. They didn't tell me they were going to get a bunch of Christian prisoners together, and I was going to talk to them. But it's okay. I don't have any problem with that. But we visited some really bad areas where guys are in solitary confinement because they're so dangerous. And then uh, a chaplain said to me, Steve, I, we're going to get together a bunch of Christians, and we want you to talk to them. And I said, are you going to keep that one locked up or, or is he coming? <laughs> and they said, no, you like this. So I walked in and they, uh, 
and they introduced me. And these guys came up and hugged me. Listen, the key to life. One guy grabbed me and held me and whispered in my ear, I love you, man. I love you. And I thought, where's this coming from? They're in jail. <laughs> when I spoke to him, I said, you know, God has given you a gift and it doesn't feel like it. You were caught. You can't pretend anything. How do you pretend you're good if you're in jail? You know the love of Christ, not despite the jail, but because of it. It's true. Correlate need and love. You know we're supposed to love the unlovable. Pete and I have been teaching that for a long time. But the kicker is you've got to be one of them. And then secondly, you ought to note in this text that proper messiahs not only love unlovable people, proper uh, messiahs re do not redeem unworthy causes. Look at 26 through 27. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it's impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Now, before we go any further, I think I need to exegete the wealth thing. If you have money and you're doing well, don't give it away, okay, or we'll never get this building paid off. Jesus was not making a universal statement about people who are affluent. He was making a universal statement about people and how we idealize and idolize our stuff, our religion, our church, our girlfriend, our husband, our children. And he was saying, come and follow me. And so it's not only impossible that... Uh, Rich people can get in there. It's impossible for a Presbyterian pastor to get to heaven. It's and until you see that, you don't get there. It's impossible for a preacher or a Bible teacher. It's impossible for a deacon and an elder. It's impossible for you to be saved until you recognize how impossible it is, you can't have it. Until you think, I am a lost cause. There are some people that maybe I don't even have the energy to get to him. I can't pull this off until you realize that. Somebody, a friend of mine, sent me this poem, and it expresses something that you've heard before, but it, he told me it was the best poem ever written. It's not. In fact, it's bad poetry, but I'm going to read it anyway. I was shocked, confused, bewildered as I entered heaven's door, not by the beauty of it all, nor the lights or its decor. But it was the folks in heaven who made me stutter and gasp, the thieves, the liars, the sinners, the alcoholics, and the trash. There stood the kid from seventh grade who swiped my lunch money twice. And next to him was my old neighbor who never said anything to anybody nice. Herb, who I always thought was rotting away in hell, was sitting pretty on cloud nine looking incredibly well. I nudged Jesus, what's the deal? I'd love to hear your take. How do all these sinners get up here? God must have made a mistake. And not only that, why is everyone so quiet, so somber? Give me a clue. Hush, child, he said. They're all in shock. No one thought they would be seeing you. <laughs> is it impossible for a wealthy person to get into the kingdom? Yeah. And it's impossible for you. And once you recognize them, and then let me show you thirdly. Proper messiahs don't uh, love unlovable people or redeem unworthy causes. They don't answer inappropriate questions. You can look at verses 28 through 29. The rich man goes away. Jesus says these controversial things about rich people. And then Peter, God bless Peter, says to Jesus, What's in it for us? That's what he's saying. Hey, we, 
My mother-in-law I left. That wasn't such a big deal. But I left my wife. I left my fishing business, and it was doing quite I left everything for you. And his question is, what's in it for me? And the amazing thing is that Jesus answered the inappropriate question. Jesus said lots of stuff, family and lands, good stuff, and persecutions. And then you get to live forever. Is that a good deal or what? Now, I would have said, that's inappropriate. After all I've done for you, how could you ask such a dumb question? But that's not the point of this. The thing I want you to, to see is that Peter had heard Jesus talk about taking up your cross and following him, leaving everything. Peter had been there when Jesus reached out to the poor and the oppressed. Peter had heard Jesus preach the Sermon on the Mount when he talked about the poor and the mo mourning and, uh, and the ones, and, and Peter knew all of that. And yet, he asked, what's in it for me? What's going on here? Let me tell you what's going on here. Peter loved Jesus so much and was so childlike that he didn't watch what he said so Jesus would be pleased with him. He just said it. <laughs> he did it in John 13 when Jesus was washing their feet. He said, you, you can do that to these other bozos, but you ain't doing that with me. Peter, don't say stuff like that. But Peter didn't have a bridle on his tongue because he worshiped at the altar of a Messiah who loved him so completely, so totally, so absolutely that he didn't have to watch his tongue. You know, I have my job. I've got to be so careful. I mean, I've got to look around before I cuss. I, I can't. I mean, you know, there are places I can't go because some of you will see me there. I mean, I'm going to get a toupee and shave this beard off and do some bad stuff. I want you to know. But I can't do that. But around Jesus, I'm totally free. He knows my heart. He knows my prayers when they're inappropriate. And he loves me so deeply and profoundly that I don't have to watch what I say. In his presence, I feel so weak and so childlike that I don't have to be careful. You say, but God is holy. Of course he's holy. But he's my father. But God is righteous. Of course he's righteous. But he likes me 10% more than he likes you. So when I cuss, I'm not going to do it around you. I'm going to do it around him. When I tell stories, I'm going to tell him every story, reveal every secret because he has so freed me with his love that I don't have to watch my tongue or my life around him. It's a severe mercy of weakness that makes you childlike. And that, and that is the kicker. My friend, uh, my friend Ken Smith uh, has a black preacher friend in Fort Lauderdale that he loved. The, his African-American friend is dead now. His name was Dr. King. And I don't know if he was related to Martin Luther King, but his name is Dr. King. So he went to him one time when he was an old man, and he said, uh, what, to what do you attribute your powerful ministry? And he said, Jesus. And he said, sometimes when I think about heaven, I think about Jesus, that he's going to grab the church by the scruff of the neck, and he's going to pick up the church and shake the church in front of the devil. Dr. King said, Jesus is going to say, this is all I had to fight you with. And I kicked your butt. <laughs> let, let me show you something. 
I told the worship team I didn't know whether I was going to do this, and they said I was a heretic, but I'm not. It's just surmised. That's permissible. Turn, if you will, if you have the Bible. If you don't, just trust me, because it's not going to be on the screen. But turn over to the 15th chapter of the same book, Mark. Listen, listen to what Mark writes here. And when evening had come, since it was a day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether Jesus was already dead. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of a rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, saw where he was laid. It's just pure surmise, but... I kind of I believe that Joseph of Arimathea is the same rich young ruler that we've been talking about today. Wouldn't that be cool? Would you like to have been there in the tomb, garden tomb that morning? I would have leaned up against another rock and watched him when he finally lugged the body in and put it on a slab of stone and rolled it away. And I'd smile, and he'd catch me. He'd say, what are you smiling about? And I'd go... He said, this is, this is nothing to smile about. I loved him too late. I didn't have the courage to stand, and now he's dead. That's what, what are you smiling about? And I think I would try to wipe it off my face. And I, I don't think I would have told him what was going to happen. It would have spoiled it for him. But I'm a preacher. I would have said something. I would have said, Joseph, it's not too late. Boy, does God have a surprise for you. Jesus is a man of surprises. And if you listen to what I taught you this morning, you're the biggest one, and I am too. You think about that. Amen.